Good afternoon. We're very glad you're able to join with us for our weekly open air outreach. This week we're coming from Glasgow City Centre, from the heart of Buchanan Street in Glasgow. And we're here from Arctic Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We are a local Glasgow congregation, and as you may gather from our title, we minister in the Arctic area of Glasgow. So we are a local congregation, we are a Scottish registered charity and uh, this is something that we try to do once a week whereby we come out and leave our pulpits and our churches behind and we come out into the city place, into the marketplace, into where people are and we seek for a short moment that we're together to be able to pass on to you something of the wonderful Christian faith that is rooted and grounded in the eternally begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no Christianity without Christ, none whatsoever, and there's no hope for this world unless we have our, our faith rooted and grounded upon what the eternally begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has done. And we want to take all our, all our teachings, all our doctrines this, this afternoon, we want to take them from the Word of God and we remind ourselves what the Scripture says about Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 going on there Paul tells Timothy the young pastor all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect truly furnished unto all good works. And there we have the Bible's verdict upon the scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God has inspired his word. He only has one book. This is it here. We have it in the scriptures of the old and the New Testament and God has inspired this word he gave it to holy men and they wrote it down they didn't write down their own opinions instead they wrote down what God inspired them to write and this is the only book that God has given mankind no other book we know that other religions would claim that they have scriptures and that their books are holy. Well, we would dispute that because there's only one holy book and this is it, the Holy Word of God. Now, the Bible contains some 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and a further 27 in the New Testament. And they're all different, yet they have the same theme running through all of these books. These books have been written over a period of around 1600 years. And there are many authors. But there's one thing, one particular theme that is universal to all the 66 books of the Bible. And you may well ask, well, what is that theme? Well, that theme is none other than a person. We could sum up the Old Testament telling us that the Lord was preparing for that day when the Son of God would come. And the New Testament is telling us about the Son of God who came and what he did and what happened after 
he returns to heaven. In other words, friends, the Word of God centers around the eternally begotten Son of God. It tells the wonderful story of what God has done in Christ for mankind. When we go back, back to the beginning, to Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and when we look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, what do we, what do we read? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is the great creator. The Bible teaches us, and we have it written down in our shorter catechism, the work of creation is God's making all things of nothing in the space of six days. That's what the Bible teaches us. The work of creation is God's making all things of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good. And part of that creation on the sixth day he made man. He created Adam out of the dust. And because he knew that Adam needed a, a suitable partner, he created Eve from Adam. And they were the first man and woman, the first husband and wife. And from them all humanity has come. They are our first parents. And when they were created, they were created perfectly. God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. And therefore, at the beginning, at the beginning of creation, and when he finished creation, he finished by creating our first parents. And they were made perfect. God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. But what happened? We said earlier, that they were created holy and pure like God himself. Well, something happened. Something happened that changed the whole course of mankind. They were given a very clear and precise and simple commandment. They were put into a wonderful garden when everything was prepared for them. And they were given a simple commandment in order that God might test them. Did they love him or not? And he gave this commandment to them. You can eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden except one. You're not to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you do eat that fruit, you will die. A very clear and simple commandment. And what's more, Adam and Eve had the power to obey. They did not know sin, and therefore they were able to obey the law of God. But the tempter came and tempted our first parents. Eve was tempted, she looked at the tree, she listened to the words of the evil one, she ate the fruit, and then she gave some to her husband, to edit also. Now tonight, or this afternoon, you might say to yourself, well, that's not really a big deal, is it? They ate the forbidden fruit. Well, God looks upon it differently. And if you think about it, no wonder he looks upon it differently. Here he was, their great creator. Give them everything that they could possibly need, provided for them gives them one clear, simple commandment, and they disobey. They showed that they did not love him as they should. 
In actual fact, they committed high treason. That's what they did, because they sided with God's enemy. Now you might well say, well, this has no relevance to me today. Well, we would disagree, because you have come from Adam and Eve, and therefore you have inherited their sinful nature. And friends, that's why we have so many problems in this world today. It's all because of sin. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated. They were estranged. They did not have that relationship with their Creator God that they once enjoyed. Sin was that barrier. And God, because He is a holy God, cannot look upon sinners. They have to be banished from His presence. And that's what happened to them. The moment that they ate the forbidden fruit, they died. They died spiritually. They did not have that relationship that they once knew and enjoyed with their Creator. And that has affected us. Because we're all from Adam and Eve, and the guilt of his first sin has been imputed to us. We have his sinful, rebellious nature, and that's why we sin. That's why there are so many problems in this world. We see that the world we live in here today, 2024, what is it, April the 19th, 2024, are we not living in troublous times? Do we not have a war in the Ukraine? Do we not have trouble in the Middle East? Do we not see Israel and Iran at lockerheads? Do we not see Israel and Hamas fighting also? And are there not many other trouble spots in this world? How do these all come about? We're all the same, we're all human. What has brought this fighting? Friends, it is sin. And mankind fights against mankind because mankind does not have that relationship with his heavenly father that he should have. Man's relationship with God is not what it should be. And that's why we have these problems. And that's why you have problems in your life. That's why there's problems in your family. That's why son is against father and daughter against mother. That's why there is divorce and bitterness and fighting. That's why there are prisons and prisoners. That's why there is crime. That's why there are thieves and robbers. That's why we have all these things. They can all be attributed to this simple, clear fact that mankind is not what he once was. He is separated from God. And because of that, he does not have any peace and he fights with his own fellow man. This is the Bible telling us. But, friends, that's a very bleak picture we acknowledge. But the Bible tells us that God has done something about it. God has seen mankind separated. God has seen mankind lost, perishing, without God, without hope in this world. And God has not been indifferent. God has done something about it. What has he done, you may well ask. Because as far as we can ascertain, the world seems to be getting worse and worse. How can you possibly say that God has done something about it? Well, he has. As soon as our first parents fell, God gave a promise. And we find it in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. A promise that was first of all delivered 
to our enemy, Satan. Here's the promise. It's a gospel promise. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now we might not grasp that initially as we pass by here, but bear in mind, the Lord God is speaking here directly to Satan to the evil one, to the one who tempted our first parents. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The woman had entered into agreement with Satan. She listened to him. And they were in some sense now on friendly terms. But God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. There's going to be hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan. What was God doing here? He was pronouncing a curse upon the evil one himself and between thy seed and her seed. And what he's talking about there is there's going to come one from the woman who's going to ultimately destroy Satan. And that one who came from the woman was the Messiah, was to be Christ the Lord, was to be the eternally begotten Son of God. Here that promise was given maybe 6,000 years ago, and that promise has been fulfilled. For in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. There Paul is telling us what happened 2,000 years ago, when the eternally begotten Son of God became a man. What a wonder, what a glory, what a delight, what a promise that has been fulfilled. The Son of God has come down and He has done something wonderful and marvelous in order to save sinners. And that's what happened. That's what happened 2,000 years ago in the fullness of time. That promise that was given in the Garden of Eden has been fulfilled. <coughs> and the Bible, friends, is a story about what God has done in Christ to rescue sinful mankind because we cannot rescue ourselves. This is what all other religions teach us. All other religions teach us if you do this, if you do that, you can work your way to heaven. Well, Christianity is completely and utterly different. It tells us what God has done in Christ. It tells us about the Savior who has come down from heaven in order to save sinners who cannot save themselves. Isaiah, some 600 years, before the birth of the Lord Jesus. He prophesied in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. Now let's be clear. The prophet is not talking about himself. The prophet earlier on in his book recognized that he was a sinner and that he was in need of a savior. He was a man of unclean lips, he said, of himself. So he's not talking about himself. He's not telling people to look unto him. Instead, he's prophesying of one who is yet to come. Look unto me and be ye saved 
all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else he's telling us about the Savior who was to come and who has come and that's the one you must look to this afternoon friends the Bible tells us this glorious and wonderful story of what God has done in Christ and Christ has come and Christ has lived a perfect life like no one else he never sinned in thought or word or deed he alone lived a sinless perfect life fulfilling the law of God perpetually something that we're required to do but we cannot do it is impossible for us yet Christ did it and he did it on behalf of others because when he lived his perfect life he was able then friends when the time came according to God's perfect plan he was able then to offer up a perfect sacrifice why did he need to offer up a perfect sacrifice, you might ask. And it's a good question. Well, the soul that sins shall die. And that's the penalty for sin. And that's the penalty that awaits sinners. It's death. But Jesus Christ took our room and our place. And because he lived a perfect life, he was able to offer up a perfect sacrifice that would satisfy the just demands of God's holy and inflexible law. You see, God is righteous. God is holy. And sin must be punished. God doesn't sweep it under the carpet. God won't overlook it. He must deal with it. And we bless God that he has dealt with it in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our room and in our place. Now, friends, what's required of you? Well, first of all, you must recognize and accept what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's God's sentence. That's God's verdict upon us all. For there is no difference. Male, female, doesn't matter the color of our skin. It doesn't matter the language we speak. It doesn't matter how educated we are. It doesn't matter about our social standing or how much money we have or we don't have it doesn't matter God's verdict on mankind is universal for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and therefore because we fall short of his glory and what he requires of us we are under his wrath and condemnation by nature that's our position that's our plight that's what you are today unless you're in Christ. So you must recognize and accept what the Bible says. There is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that can stand before God uncondemned. None. Young or old, it matters not. Doesn't matter if you go to church or chapel or whatever doesn't matter your religion it doesn't matter we're all guilty before God by nature this is humbling this truly is the offense of the cross but we'll never get anywhere friends unless we accept what God has to say it doesn't matter what the law of the land says it doesn't matter what you think it doesn't matter what your neighbors or your friends say. What matters is what God says. The righteous judge. 
the divine judge, the judge who is pure and holy, the judge who is described in the Bible as, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. That's the God you have to deal with. Not a man-made judge, but a judge who's able to look into your hearts, a judge who can read your thoughts, a judge who knows your words even before you utter them, the judge that knows your actions, knows what you've done last night and the night before, knows what you will do tonight. Darkness cannot hide anything from the great God of heaven. So friends, you must first recognize you need a savior. And secondly, you must recognize that God has provided the savior. There's only one savior. The Lord Jesus said himself, read it in the Bible, don't just take my word for it, but you'll find it in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Jesus is telling his disciples and all of us here today there is no way to God unless you come through the Lord Jesus Christ he is the only mediator for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus who gave his life for ransom for all to be testified in due time. Isn't it not marvelous that God who has been offended by our behavior? Who? How do you know, sir? How do you know? A young man there says Jesus won't save. Well, we know he does because he's alive. He suffered. He died. He was put into a tomb. But the day came when he arose. No, no rock could seal the tomb. Nothing could hold him. He broke the bands of death. He's alive forevermore. We don't tell you about a savior who's done certain things, but who is now dead and smoldering in the grave. No, we tell you of one who is alive. And he's alive and coming back one day. It's good to be here, friends. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland, continuing a local congregation. We're going to take a short break. And may the Lord bless his word to you this afternoon. Hello again. We're glad you're able to join with us for our weekly open-air outreach. We're from Partick Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We meet at two Thornwood Terrace. If you go up Dumbarton Road, you'll come to a police station. Opposite the police station, go up a hill there, and you'll come first of all to Thornwood Primary School. Well, we're next door at the crossroads, and we bid you a warm and sincere welcome. Come along any Lord's Day, that is Sunday, the first day of the week, come along, 11 o'clock, our first service, then we have our early evening service at 6 p.m. And we would extend a warm welcome to you to any of these public services. We also meet on a Wednesday afternoon at 7.30, uh, Wednesday evening I should say, at 7.30 and you are welcome to come along to these services also. <clears throat> it may be that you're not in the habit of going to a Christian place of worship. Maybe because of the COVID restrictions, you've stopped going. 
and you find it difficult to come back, well, let us give you a warm and sincere welcome to come along. And maybe you've never been one who's gone to a Christian place of worship, and maybe you're a bit apprehensive, wondering what will happen. Well, let us put your mind at ease. Come along, no obligation. We'd love to see you. And maybe you're someone who doesn't have a, a Bible. Well, friends, make yourself known. There are people here handing out gospel tracts. Let them know that you would like a Bible, and we'll see what we can do for you. We know the Bible is inspired by God. In fact, it is the only book that has been inspired by God. It's God's only book. And we're delighted to be able to give you one if you so wish. <clears throat> but today we want to try to tell you something concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it may well be that as you're going around here, you're going to your shops, doing some shopping, maybe going for coffee, maybe you're working, whatever, and you really don't have much time to consider these things. Well, let me try to impress upon you, friends, that you need to make time to consider these things. Because the sad reality is, as we all know, but we need to be reminded, the reality is we're mortal. And the reality is we're here today. To hear oh, I don't agree with it, sir. We want to hear about the facts of life, don't we? We want to hear about why we're here. Well, the Bible tells us why we're here. We're here because we have been created by God. And we're here for a purpose. The Bible tells us man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's why we have been created. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And as I was saying earlier, friends, we need to consider this fact that we're all mortal. The day will come when we shall be gathered to our fathers. We shall be gathered into eternity. And where will you go? There's no point in burying your head in the sand. You have to face up to this reality. The day will come. You might have a deathbed experience. You might die by accident. You might die by a crime. Who knows? But we are mortal. We are here today. And we're gone tomorrow. And you might think, well, I don't want to consider the things of Christ at this moment. You might well say to yourself, well, I'm young, I'm fit, I've got many years ahead of me. Well, we sincerely hope you do, but you don't know these things. That's why the Bible tells us, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And what the Bible would exhort us to do, friends, is to make our peace with God now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time to get right with God. Do not delay. Do not procrastinate. Do not put this to the back of your mind. You must deal with these matters because time is not on our hands. We don't know these things. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. There in Proverbs chapter 27 verse 1, there the wisest man that ever lived at that point in time, he tells us, and what wonderful instruction it is, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Here you are on Buchanan Street on Friday afternoon, and maybe you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. 
well, it's good to think about these things, but you cannot boast about tomorrow. You cannot boast about tonight. We don't know one moment from the next moment. We may be rushed into eternity. And friends, what we want to ask you this afternoon is, are you ready for eternity? Are you ready to pass in to eternity? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The psalmist, Moses, the psalmist in Psalm 90, what does he say to us? So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We need to be taught these things. God must teach us that our days are short, even at the longest. What is 70 years or 80 years or 90 years in comparison with eternity? Can you co comprehend eternity? On and on and on and on everlasting. What is 70 years in comparison with eternity? It is but a flash. And therefore, we need to be taught these things. And that's why the psalmist says that God is to teach us. And very often God does teach us. He teaches us by providence. What does that mean? Well, sometimes our lives are thrown upside down. Sometimes our lives are very good, they're happy, and then suddenly what happens? A loved one is taken from us. A relative, a friend, a brother, a spouse, a parent is taken from us. They're gone, we're left. God is teaching us by providence that one day we too will go. And one day our seat will be empty. One day the space that we occupy will no longer be there, we'll be gone. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What wisdom do we need to apply our hearts to? Well, I put it to you, it's the wisdom of the gospel. It's the wisdom that comes from the eternally begotten Son of God. It's the wisdom of Him who came to seek and to save that which was lost. It's his wisdom that we are to submit to. His wisdom is found in the Bible. And the Bible tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. And the Bible tells us it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Yes, friends, we might not like to think upon this, but it is appointed unto man wants to die. Your birth has been appointed, and so has your death. And after death, friends, we look forward to judgment. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say, knowing Therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What, did, what does he want to persuade them to? He wants them to be persuaded to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as he has freely offered to us in the gospel. That's what he wants. Because, friends, those who believe upon Jesus Christ have their sins forgiven and they are reconciled to God, and they are ready for eternity. Paul tells us at the end of Romans chapter 4, that Christ, he was delivered for our offenses, and raised to life for our justification. And then he goes on to say, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, do you have peace with God? Be honest. I don't expect you to audibly answer me, but answer yourself. Do you have peace with God? Are you ready to meet your Creator? Are you ready for eternity? 
Are you ready to stand before King Jesus? Are you ready to give an account? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why we come out, friends. We join with the Apostle Paul. We embrace his sentiments. He traveled over all of the known world with this gospel message that men and women and boys and girls are to repent and to believe the gospel in order that they might be ready to meet their Creator because we have all sinned. We're all like sheep. We've all gone astray. We've all sinned in the sight of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And by nature, we are not ready to meet God. We're still under his wrath and condemnation. But that's why we come out, friends, to tell you there is a way whereby you can be reconciled to God. And it's found in the gospel, which is good news, and it's good news from heaven. And you are to embrace this good news today. For today is the day of salvation. You know, as you're hearing this, you're saying to yourself, I'm sure, well, you know, that man, he's talking some truth. He's talking the truth, I recognize that, but I'll wait maybe, uh, I'll consider it another time. I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to live my life, and maybe when I'm older, maybe then I will consider it. What does the Bible say? Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. There is a, a special exhortation to the young because the young, they think they're always going to be young. And they think that their lives are always going to be the way that they are now. They never realize that very soon will come middle age, then old age. And that's the evil days that the Bible's talking about. These are evil days because when you get older, you don't have all your faculties. Life starts to decline, does it not? and you depend upon other people more and more and more. These are the evil days he's talking about. And his exhortation to the young is, is to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ now. Today, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. In other words, give your life to Christ now. Give the very flower, the very blossom the very apex of your life to Christ now. Don't think that you can give the dregs of your life to Christ at the end. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ now. Take up the cross and follow him now. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days, that's the days of old age, come not nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. This, friends, is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief, the Apostle Paul says. You know, the default position with the natural man is that God hates him and God is all out to destroy him. And that's why the natural man 
runs from God. That's why the natural man does not like to come to the house of God and to hear the word of God proclaimed. The natural man does not like to hear the gospel because he thinks that somehow God is all out against him. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is all for us. He's all for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you want to see the love of God, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to see the depth of the love of God, go to the cross. There you see our substitute being punished in our room and place. There you see the love of God when he gave that his only begotten son. And there you see the love of the Savior who was prepared to suffer and die and to experience the pains of hell in order to save mankind. There, friends, look at the cross. Get your understanding of the cross all right, and then you'll have some, and only some, understanding of the love of God, because you cannot plumb the depths of the love of God. But you can see it. He doesn't just simply love in words. He loves in deed. And he has loved mankind to this extent that he sent his only begotten son. And is that not marvelous? Is God not the one who has been offended by the behavior of mankind? Did not God make us upright? God created man, male and female, after his own image in knowledge righteousness and holiness with dominion over the creatures that's how our first parents were created they were pure and holy and righteous but they sinned they turned they rebelled against god did god dispose with them did he ruin them totally no Instead, he enacted a plan whereby the Savior would come to save. And there we see the love of God, friends. And that's what we want to present to you this afternoon. The love of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to warn you that outside of Christ, our God is an all-consuming fire. He has provided the way of salvation. He has provided the way whereby we can be reconciled to God and whereby we can be at peace with Him. But if we reject that way, He will punish. He will condemn. This is the message of the Bible. This is a message we're to heed. This is a message we are to embrace. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that in that he hath raised him from the dead. That verse that we find in Acts chapter 17 is reminding us that there is a day of judgment and the judge has been appointed and the date has been set. The judge will be none other than Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's why we come out because today friends we present to you Jesus the Savior 
Get a grip. Get a grip. That's blasphemy. We're out here to tell you about the Son of God. The Son of God who is the Savior of all who put their faith and hope and trust upon Him. And we're out to tell you that today, this day, here, Friday the, what is it, Friday the, the 19th of April 2024 is the day of grace. And the Savior in all His fullness has been proclaimed to you and you are to put your faith and hope and trust upon him he's the one who has come to seek and to save that which was lost he says I have not come to destroy men's lives but to save them but the day will come if you reject Christ this one that we proclaim to you as Savior will one day be your judge the day of grace will come to an end. The day when he returns. The day of grace will end. And it will be the day of judgment. And this one that we proclaim to you today as Savior will be your judge. Therefore, lay hold of Christ today. He's the only one who has come from heaven. He's the only one God has appointed as Savior. And he is the only one who can save. We're going to take a very short break, but may God bless his word to you this afternoon. Good afternoon again. We're here from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing a local congregation. And we meet at 2 Ornwood Terrace. If you go up Dumbarton Road, you will come to the police station. Opposite the police station, if you go up the hill there, you'll come first of all to Thornwood Primary School, and then you'll meet our building at the crossroads. You are welcome to come along. We meet on the Lord's Day Sunday, the first day of the week, at 11 a.m., and we also meet in the early evening at 6 p.m. and then we have a midweek meeting Wednesday at 7.30 and again you are welcome to any of these services and don't feel any pressure you will be warmly welcome many people have the wrong idea about the gospel about Christianity about the Bible and about God himself I love God. and they think basically that God is not for them well the Bible would tell a completely different story God is our creator he created our first parents they were holy and pure and upright they sinned but he promised a saviour and he did something about it and we are delighted to inform you that in the fullness of time God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons and in the fullness of time God sent forth his saviour our saviour the Lord Jesus Christ the God appointed Savior and friend the message of the Bible is that all of us every single individual who truly puts their faith and hope and trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved that's a promise from the Word of God and God's Word will not fall to the ground for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved now why do we need to call upon him to be saved 
We need to call upon him to be saved because we're sinners. And this is what we find offensive. But we must humble ourselves and submit to what God tells us and teaches us in the Bible. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all missed the mark, every single human being. It doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter. We're all sinners in the sight of God. And what's more, we cannot make ourselves right. We cannot reconcile ourselves to God. We cannot get in his good books. Impossible. We cannot win his favor. <coughs> we have to submit to the way that he himself has provided. And that is remarkable because he's the one who has been offended, yet he is the one who has provided the way whereby we can be reconciled to him. He has taken the initiative. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was God who moved. It was God who worked. It was God who saw our position and predicament and he did something about it. And in order to be saved, you need to submit to his way. And his way is in the Lord Jesus Christ because he lived a perfect life. And when we believe upon him, his perfect life is given to us. His perfect obedience becomes our perfect obedience <clears throat> and he died he paid the price of sin he paid the price that we should pay because the soul that sinneth it shall die and that's why Christ died not that he was a sinner that was impossible but he became our substitute and he suffered and died in the room and in the place of sinners and here, friends, is the glory and the wonder and the sparkle of the Christian gospel. When you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. All of your sins are forgiven. Why? Because Jesus has paid the price, the penalty for them on your behalf. It seems incredible. It is. It's divine. It's wonderful. No man could ever devise such a way, such a plan. But God has a way that meets with his approval, a way that satisfies his justice, his holiness, his righteousness, and a way that satisfies his love, his grace, and his mercy. All of these things, all of these attributes are seen when we go to the cross and when we study the theology of the cross. There, how the Son of God suffered and died in the room and in the place of sin, of sinners. You see, God is a holy God, and God must deal with sin. He will not sweep it under the carpet. He will not wink at it. He must deal with it. And he did in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself this afternoon, well, I know I am a sinner, and I'm a great sinner, you might well be saying. And you might be saying to yourself, well, God would never accept me. I'm too bad. I'm too old. My heart is too hard. My heart is too wicked. I cannot change my life now. Let me read a verse for you. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression 
of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. Our God is a God who delights in mercy. And those that repent and believe the gospel, they will find God is merciful. All your sins cleansed, forgiven. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like wool, though they be like crimson, they shall be like wool. What a transformation. The Lord forgives, he cleanses, and he gives the Holy Spirit. He gives the Holy Spirit that we might have the power to live a new life. Because when you become a Christian, friends, your life changes. Everything becomes new. The Christian is one who is a new individual. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's what happens. Therefore, we must repent. We must turn our backs upon the, the old life, turn away from our lying, turn away from our cheating, turn away from our fornication, turn away from adultery, Turn away from our Sabbath breaking. Turn away from our idolatry. Turn away from our gossiping. Turn away from our covetousness. Live a new life. The Lord Jesus Christ gives that power in his spirit. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, Christianity, friends, it's about Jesus, and it's about the new life that he gives. He said to his disciples, Behold, he says to them, I have come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. Christianity is new life. It's new life whereby we, we fight against the sin that's within us, against the world and against the devil. And we lay hold on eternal life. That's what is there before us. That's why we're told repent and believe the gospel. And indeed God commands all men everywhere now to repent. Every one of us, this is the gospel call. This is the good news from heaven in the gospel in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. God commands all men everywhere to repent. What does that mean? It means to turn our backs upon our old life, upon our old lifestyle, upon our old habits, and particularly upon what we thought about Jesus Christ. The likelihood is that the vast majority of people that are speaking to this afternoon are Christ rejectors. Well, when you repent, you must stop rejecting Christ. You must lay hold of him as he is freely offered to you in the gospel. It's been a pleasure to be out here this afternoon. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland, continuing a local congregation. We meet in Partick, two to four, Thornwood Terrace. And we want to close by quoting this verse here, a verse that's well known to us. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Here the prophet Isaiah is not talking about himself, he's not asking people to look to him, instead he was speaking about that Saviour who was to come, and who has come. Look unto him. Who is he? He's the Lord Jesus Salvation is found in none other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved.
What does salvation mean? We talk about it. What does it mean? Well, it means to be saved. It means to be delivered. It means to be set free. It means to be emancipated. What do we need to be set free from? We need to be set free from our sin. Because we're all sinners. And sin has a hold upon us. And when we come to Christ, what happens? We're free. If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And friends, we are free in Christ. The power of sin has been broken. We no longer know that guilt. We no longer know that conscience that troubled us because of our sin. It's all gone. Why? Because Jesus Christ has forgiven our sins. Look unto him, therefore. You must cast your eyes upon him. You must trust upon this one who came from heaven. He's the only saviour, the only one that ever came from heaven, the only one that can save. No one else can. I don't know who you're following, but if you're not following Christ, then you'll perish. It doesn't matter what religion you follow. If you're not saved by Christ, you'll never be saved. He is the only saviour. He is the one whom God has appointed. He has come with the stamp and with the approval of heaven. And what's more, he has gone back into heaven after suffering and after dying and after being put in a tomb, he arose on the third day. And after he had been seen for a period of 40 days, he ascended up into heaven where he is today until that day when he will come with the clouds in power and in glory. Oh, friends, are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day when you will see him? Are you ready for that day when you'll stand before him? Oh, you might reject him today, but one day you'll meet him eye to eye. You'll give account. How will you fear? Friends, you must have your sins forgiven. Are you? So does the devil. Oh, aye. He's a great church goer. No, no, no. What church do you go to? Well, what, what is a Christian, can I ask you? Are you trusting him that he, yeah. your sins are forgiven? Yeah, good. Well, you go to heaven, Jesus takes you to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Yeah, very good to hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't. No, you're quite unique. <laughs> Certainly today, anyway. How old are you? Uh, 14. 14. Okay, God bless. What's your name? Very good. Thank you. Well, we're going to draw our time to a close this afternoon. But it's been good to be with you. And may the Lord be pleased to follow with his indispensable blessing. For without his blessing, we can do nothing.